Are known frauds used to support evolution still taught in schools today? Stay tuned to find out on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today on Creation Magazine Live, we're going to be talking about frauds used to support evolution. We've actually got a flyer. We did up a two recently exposed frauds used to support evolution. And the two that we'll be talking about, one of them is the peppered moths, mm -hmm. this notion that moths sitting on trees, uh, the, the population type change, or the, 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 there was changes within a population, and that's used to support evolution, mm -hmm. terrible example of evolution. And the second one we'll be dealing with, actually the first one we'll be dealing with is embryonic recapitulation. Right. This notion that as living things go through the process to the point where they're born, they retrace their evolutionary ancestry. Right. And uh, many of you will be familiar with the pictures, uh, the pictures uh, that were done by Ernst Haeckel uh, many, many years ago. Uh, show extreme similarities in some of these different animals here. Right. Now, embry embryologists have known for a long time that th this, these pictures that, that we've commonly seen are absolutely false. But uh, a bomb exploded in 1997 when an evolutionary embryologist actually published real photos of embryos showing the, the, the many differences. And of course, it, it was just so blatantly obvious to, to many people then. Here are the original uh, embryo drawings that Ernst Haeckel drew, and here are the photographs that Michael Richardson uh, actually took. And so even though many people know these were f th this was frauds, th this became just an embarrassment to the evolutionary community because it was just so obvious now how bad this was. As a matter of fact, Michael Richardson, an evolutionist himself, said this, about uh, those original drawings by Haeckel. This is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It's shocking to find that someone once one thought was a great scientist was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. <laughs> Look, he's so obviously offended here. Yeah. What Haeckel did was to take a human embryo and copy it. These are fakes. And so, again, this, this was a huge embarrassment to the uh, evolutionary community. But lately, uh, because it's such an embarrassment, um, there's, there's been a, an evolutionist trying to rehabilitate yes. uh, Heckel's, uh, Heckel's theories, uh, kind of revising history. We've got some revisionist history happening here uh, and, um, around the science here and, uh, and actually criticizing th this, so we're, we're going to take a look at that. Yeah, that's remarkable. Uh, first, some background on Heckel. Heckel was born in 1834, uh, died in 1919. He was a professor of zoology and a marine biologist. He knew human anatomy. That, that's, uh, that's one of the main points we can make. He was a detailed, he was an artist. He could make detailed drawings. He had that ability as well. But he's best known for this deception. That's, right. what, that's, that's what he's going down in history for, for using his talent as an artist combined with his ability as a doctor right. to basically forge these drawings. Right. And uh, so he, he had a couple of uh, works that he did, uh, Natural History of Creation, the History of the Evolution of Mankind, in which he, he had these, uh, these diagrams in and such. Now, um, Robert John Richards, we need to uh, separate a couple of names here. So there's, there's Ernst Haeckel, the man who drew the original drawings. There's Michael Richardson, who is the he embryologist who took the photos. And then there's this man, Robert John Richards. He's a professor of uh, history at the University of Chicago, a professor of history. And uh, he made a, a, a real effort to rehabilitate not only the history around Haeckel, but also the very embryo sketches themselves. And uh, in 2008, 2009, he published a book and a paper Heckel's embryos, frauds not proven, in which he tried to, to, to just change this. He actually yeah. attacks Michael Richardson, an embryologist. So we've got a historian attacking an embryologist mm. about the science. It's interesting. Um, and we'll look into that. And uh, of course, uh, Richardson's and his co workers' uh, uh, photos, the actual photos, um, had, had shown just how far Heckel's um, fraud had been. And so. Um, uh, this is what Richard tries to, to critique. He tries to prove that Richard's works are, are logically mischievous. Richardson's, the embryologist, he, he says that they're, they're mis mischievous, historically naive, and founded on highly misleading photography. 
So stay tuned to see if this historian is right about this evolutionary embryologist uh, scientific findings. Most people are under the impression that coal forms slowly in swamps over millions of years, but this view neglects the testimony of tree trunk fossils that cut across many coal layers known as polystrate fossils. If these tree trunks were buried gradually over thousands of years, the top parts of the trees would have rotted away before they could be protected by sediment. Derek Ager, professor of geology at University College of Swansea, recognised this when he wrote of trees buried in coal seams. If one estimates the total thickness of the British coal measures as about a thousand meters laid down in about 10 million years, then assuming a constant rate of sedimentation, it would have taken 100,000 years to bury a tree 10 meters high, which is ridiculous. He then went on to say, we cannot escape the conclusion that sedimentation was at times very rapid indeed. So the slow swamp story should itself be laid to rest. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Okay, let's see if Richard's criticisms of Richardson's photos is valid. Right. Now, we need to get in some background here on Heckel's drawings. One of the first problems with the illustrations on the first row of Heckel's uh, comparative embryo plates in his work, Anthropogeny, uh, is that he drew many embryos, including the humans and chick embryos, without uh, pericardial or heart bulges, where they actually possess, possess them in, uh, in reality. Now in humans, uh, the cardiovascular system is one of the first entities to uh, develop in the early embryo and this is because the growing embryo needs a constant supply of oxygen and, uh, and nutrients. And from even as early as 25 days old, the human embryo already displays a clear, uh, a clear pericardial bar bulge, soon becoming a heart bulge and the usual age for comparing these embryos uh, in, in um, Heckel's drawings here are around 28 days. So you can see in the, in the um, photograph here. Here's, here's Heckel's drawing of the human, but the human embryo at the same stage here, it, it's, it's clear that he omitted that from uh, his diagram. Right, and now at this stage we need to repeat that Haeckel was a fully qualified medical doctor and so he was acquainted with human biology. Right. Uh, get around this idea of, you know, could he have not known what was going on here. Right. But uh, also in the, uh, in the chick embryo, as well. He doctored that here in the drawings as well. Right. Uh, this is a problem uh, for human and chicken embryos. In some other classes of vertebrates have the same problem. Uh, some fishes and amphibians may not display heart bulges at all, uh, at least visibly. Right. Uh, and, and yet he, he's doctored these to make them all look very similar. Right. So some have heart, uh, you know, bulges, some don't. But what he did is he just homogenized it all to make it all it, look similar right. to support his theory that, you know, we all go through the same evolution. We have, no, we're I mean, we're all the same. We yeah. all came from the same stuff. Ontogeny re recapitulates phylogeny. This was the phrase he used. Sounds cool. Yeah, basically saying that, I mean, and this has been discarded years ago, but he was actually promoting that as you grew in your mother's womb, you started off like kind of like a little worm and then you're kind of like a fish and yeah. then you're more like an ape and a, a pig and, and then an like ape. A and, chicken and, yeah, and, and of yeah. course, that's been thrown out, but th this is some of the things that he was actually actually promoting and using these concepts. This is why he was uh, homogenizing all this kind of stuff. Right. Another thing that seems to have surfaced is that uh, in, his, in his illustrations is the fact that the embryos lack limb buds at certain places where he should have shown them. Now, uh, at whatever stage is selected for comparison, some species of embryos will display limb buds while others won't. So again, we're at the same uh, situation with the heart bulges uh, again. Right. But, um, and if you actually look at, uh, you know, the, the, the photographs uh, compared to his drawings again, you'll see that, um, you know, limb buds that are on some aren't on Heckel's drawings. So again, right. he, he's, yeah. he's just doctored this. And the question arises, again, whether or not Haeckel knew this. I mean, did he make an honest mistake? But that's, that, that doesn't wash at all. I mean, right. he was a doctor. He certainly, certainly should have known this. Um, and uh, the remarkable answer is, yes, Haeckel did know what he was doing. This was a deliberate, a deliberate problem. Right. Evolutionary biologist Scott Gilbert, uh, he's the author of a developmental biological book. He points out, interestingly, this knowledge appears to be old hat among German biologists. Well, Haeckel was a German biologist. Exactly. So there is clear evidence that, uh, that Haeckel removed, uh, for example, the limb buds. 
Uh, here are pictures you can see. You can see uh, Richard Seaman, uh, a scientist at that time that was uh, publishing on uh, you know, these, this, this type of work. Um, and Heckel actually doctored Seaman's drawing. You can see here how he completely removed the limb bud. And, um, and, and Heckel used the, this limbless drawing in at least two places in his fifth uh, edition of uh, Anthropogeny and, and, and other of his books. So this isn't the case where, oh, well, you know, the science wasn't quite developed or he maybe right. didn't know. Okay. Here you've got an expert in his field. He's got access to other experts in their field. But he clearly, that the evidence clearly shows, uh, you know, R Richard's trying to make this, uh, this excuse up because it's such a damaging uh, uh, thing to the evolutionary cause. It, it just doesn't hold water. Yes, and Richard's is aware of that paper, and yet he tries to make a another excuse for Haeckel's deliberate deception. He tries to argue that Haeckel ad adapted the embryo drawings for an earlier stage of development. Right. So what he was saying is like, well, the, 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 the limb buds hadn't come up yet, but that's not true. Right. The, 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 the day, you know, that the, the embryo drawings come from is around 28 days. And if you look at the pictures at those days, they should have been present. So, uh, you know, Heckel should have been, uh, adapted other morph morphological features if, if, he, if he actually took it from an earlier phase. Then all of them should reflect that earlier phase, and, y and yet it doesn't. So uh, the pharyngeal arches would be less pronounced, other features would be more generalized, etc. So Heckel knew what he was doing, and he deliber deliberately did it, and it's been in textbooks for many, many years. Stay tuned for more. Refuting evolution is a powerful, concise summary that explains where the common evidences used to promote evolution in textbooks are wrong, while at the same time showing how creation is better supported by scientific observations. It will stimulate much discussion and help students and teachers think more critically about the creation-evolution debate, particularly the often overlooked differences between operational and historical science and how they relate to the topic of origins. Order your copy today at creation.com. Okay, so in his paper, Richards, the historian, blasts uh, Richardson, the embryologist, uh, for his conclusions uh, versus Heckel, uh, founded on highly misleading photography. That was the, the words Richard used. Yes, so yes. He's, he's attacking the scientist on his claims. And of course, if we look at the diagrams here, here's Heckel's original drawings, and here are the photographs again that Michael Richardson took. Well, you can obviously see that the, the, the photos um, are completely different from the drawings. And, uh, and so what Richards uh, does to counter uh, Richardson's uh, photography here is he, he says the following. Several, but not all, of the photographed embryos retain the attached yolk sac and other maternal material. This exaggerates their differences from Heckel's images. The bulge of the salamander is not part of the embryo, rather it is the yolk sac, as is the case for the fish and the human embryos, though not for the chicken and the rabbit, from which the yolk sacs have been removed. Wow, so Richards is saying that Richardson's team, the photographers and so on, they're doing the same thing that Haeckel did. Right. They're, they're modifying the embryos and then photographing them in this, uh, this uh, fictitious state or whatever. It's right. Amazing. And you you, you got to ask, <laughs> why? Uh, Richardson himself is an em evolutionist. Why would he yes. do that? And, and if you actually look at the original paper by Richardson, the embryologist, he, they actually said this. The extra embryonic membranes were either missing or were removed by us. However, the Atlantis was preserved where present. So this team of biologists actually were careful with the extra embryonic materials. And contrary to what the historian says, the bulge, not a typical yolk sac in the biological sense of the word, of the salamander is part of and attached to the body of the embryo, unlike the human embryo, where a, a yolk sac is outside of the embryo itself. So in many... Uh, species as well. It would be impossible uh, to separate the yolk from the body of the embryo without doing violence um, to the structure of the embryo and misrepresenting it. So exactly contrary to what Richard says, these photos are accurate. So there's another example of, of where uh, Haeckel distorted the pictures, right. as we've seen. Yep. And there's other, there's other creatures as well, that, right. uh, as shown by Richardson's team, that, um, uh, that, that are, have been distorted. That's right. So Richardson, some of his, um, uh, actually took some of Rich, uh, <laughs> Richards, <laughs> I keep getting this confused, actually took pictures of what uh, Richardson, the embryologist, had done 
and actually uh, produced them in the way that he thought Richardson should have done it. Okay, here's some original differences here you can see on the screen between um, um, you know, just various creatures and how some have the bulges and some don't have the bulges and so on. But uh, let's take a look at what Richards has done here. Richards says, no, 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 no. Because of the differences in the heart bulges and, and, and the different stages of development and things like that, you can see three of the creatures that Richards has, has taken the photographs from what Richardson has done and he's made them the way he thinks Richardson, the embryologist, should have done it. We should have taken the photos. Right. So he's done a couple of different things here. Um, and really what he's done is he's taken real photographic evidence from an embryologist, a scientist, and doctored them. He's done the exact same thing <laughs> Heckel did, right? Um, and so, uh, one, the heart bulge of the human embryo, which is completely removed in Richard's re-engineering. Uh, that kind of removal, it can't be justified. Uh, based on, uh, on what real science is showing. Straightening out of the chick, uh, chick embryo's uh, torsion and, and inflection, literally twisting the body of the, uh, you know, you can see in the diagram. In photograph where, B there. Yeah, yeah, in photograph B. Um, and, and so, you know, Heckel's excuse was that, well, this, this happens at a later stage of development, but it doesn't. Um, if we take the embryos at the stages of development that they were photographed, that it's, just, it's just not... Uh, not correct. And he re uh, the re-engineering of the salamander body in order to get rid of the bulge, you can see right in the photograph there, again, completely unjustified according to we know yeah. uh, what scientists know about uh, embryonic the thing development. Is, even with all that doctoring, they still don't look similar. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you can try to make them look similar, but, uh, but they don't. That's right. If you look at uh, diagrams of all these different uh, embryos here, because Heckel was very um, specific on which one he, ones he chose. He chose the ones that looked most similar uh, to begin with anyway. So uh, anyway, uh, Richard whines about the, uh, the set of embryos that was used in comparison, etc. And he, he tries to get around some things. But really what the evidence is showing is, again, that this is completely unwarranted and it's just used to bolster the evolutionary uh, story. How did the peacock get such a spectacular tail? Bothered by this question, Charles Darwin wrote, The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever I gaze at it makes me sick. Sometime later, though, Darwin proposed his theory of sexual selection, which basically says that the peacock evolved its exotic tail to attract a mate, thus helping it produce more offspring and thus increasing the numbers with attractive tails. But a recent critical review published in the prestigious journal Science has pointed out that the theory has fatal problems and needs to be replaced. However, other evolutionary scientists have rushed to Darwin's defence, contending that the authors failed to provide a genuine alternative theory. But what if there is no evolutionary explanation? Perhaps the peacock tail continually evades an evolutionary explanation because it didn't evolve, but was designed after all. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So having seen that Richard's claims are uh, pretty bogus here regarding uh, Haeckel's drawings and the photographs and so on, the question is, are these drawings, Haeckel's drawings, still being used in textbooks today to try to convince students of evolution? And right. the answer is yes. In fact, Richardson himself said this. In 1997, Richardson acknowledged that there are at least 50 recent biology textbooks which use the drawings uncritically. Right. Incredible. Yep. Yeah. And, and Cal, you've got actually a, a personal account of, uh, of exactly this type of thing. I do. Uh, so, uh, just a couple of years ago, my youngest daughter, she goes into uh, grade 10 um, science in her local high school, and she brings her science textbook home. And of course, I start looking through it. Right in her science textbook, very modern textbook. This isn't a 20 year old textbook, very, very modern textbook. There are Heckel's embryo drawings there. Yeah. And I wow. ask her about it, and she says, yes, the teacher is using those embryos to convince the, the students of evolution. This is part of a proof of evolution. And the only difference between the uh, pictures was they had color added to them. You, you could literally take the original photo or, or, or sketches that Heckel did, place them against the textbook. They're identical, except they've colorized them a little bit. And, 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 it, and it's completely fraudulent. So. I, you know, after I hyperventilated a little bit, <laughs> I picked up the phone. I get on the phone to my, you know, set an appointment. I go down to talk to the science teacher. 
uh, very calmly. I've got all the documentation printed off because evolutionists have acknowledged that those right. those things have yeah. been forged. Most modern evolutionists agree with that. Sure. I took it down. She wasn't even aware that they were forgeries. She's a science teacher. She wasn't even aware. She'd gone through school. She just uncritically learned what was popped in there. And so she said, well, why would they do that? And I said, well, that's an interesting question. I said, now, yeah. you know, are you going to go contact the people who create these uh, textbooks? And, and, well, that's not my department. So is she still teaching it till this day? I don't know. I would hope not. Yeah. But if it's part of the official curriculum, yeah. there you go. So what does the future hold? Uh, an, an article uh, kind of reveals, uh, reveals where things are going. Right. Here. He stated that the drawings are still widely reproduced in textbooks. This is and, Richardson. This is Richardson yeah. again, yeah. Uh, and, and review articles and continue to exert a significant influence on the development of ideas in this field. Right. So here we go with the future. Wow. Exactly. They're still in use. Um, Stephen Jay Gould uh, actually said, we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number if not the ma a majority of modern textbooks. Now, Gould uh, is passed on. He was an atheist. He was an evolutionist. Uh, he was actually one of the more uh, critical evolutionists because he, he actually acknowledged there were many holes in, in, in the standard theory of evolution. Um, and he was just, he called it mindless recycling, right? Yes. Um, and it's, yeah. just, it's just not great. Um, and uh, in, in textbooks, in, in curriculum that's being uh, brought up for, for schools now, um, we, we, we see many of this, much of this recycling going on. In a section titled Anatomical and Development Homologies as Evidence for Evolution, uh, there's a publisher out there right now, um, again, using this argument that, that all these creatures share similarities. And here are the, here's the picture in the proposed textbook. Now, what does that top line of embryos look like hmm. to you? It's pretty familiar. It's, it's the same pictures. Again, th these ones aren't even colorized. They just have color around them. But again, this is... <laughs> Gould was accurate. Mindless recycling is, is what that is. That's when, right. when you know that's, that's fraudulent. Um, in a section titled uh, Evidence of Common Ancestry, uh, materials submitted by Rice University, you can see some of their uh, the things here from their student guide. All right? Um, look at the top. Top yeah, again, section of they it. look really familiar. They're exactly what what uh, we've seen over and over. Look at one of the uh, the questions here. The chart or the, the statements. The chart below was used to show how similar stages in development help establish evolutionary relationships. This type of evidence for evolution is known as, and then the student is supposed to, uh, you know, uh, click the answer and look at the diagrams that are being used again. It, this this is fraud yeah. Yeah. taught to students over and over again, still in modern textbooks, and it. You'd hope that the evolutionists <laughs> would be ashamed about this and get rid of it, to be honest. We'll be back. Creation Ministries International staff, many from a wide variety of scientific disciplines, have produced thousands of articles now available in a massive online database. Some of the topics covered include the feasibility of Noah's Ark and evidence for a global flood, scientific arguments that explain observations in astronomy within a young Earth time frame, recent discoveries that support dinosaurs fitting with biblical history, evidence from biology that shows that the type of change that is observed in living things has absolutely nothing to do with evolution. Got questions? Get answers at creation.com. All right, we just spent some time covering one of the frauds of the two that are mentioned in our two recently exposed frauds. The other one that's mentioned in this flyer is the peppered moth scenario that appears in, in, uh, in just as many textbooks, I'm sure, as the, uh, the embryonic heckles, recapitulation. Yeah. Now, what, what's the deal with the peppered moth? It was supposed to be an example of natural selection, and, and we would agree with that. Right but it's not an example of evolution. And it, it's explained in the flyer there, the moths change varieties with all within a kind. Uh, it's actually, if I was an evolutionist, it, it'd be a terrible example of evolution. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. But right. nevertheless, just like Haeckel's embryo drawings, modern evolutionists have tried to revive that. One of, one of the things that we've written on fairly recently is that the moths don't even rest on trees. They were glued onto the trees to get the photographs that we see in textbooks. Right. And the evolutionists have said, well, that, that, that's not fair. And, 
And uh, it doesn't uh, matter they, anyway, and it's, it still shows natural selection. It still shows natural selection, uh, and, and they focused on the moths, on us saying that the moths are glued on trees, but right. that's not the point. That wasn't the, our argument. The, the, that wasn't the argument. The argument is it's a terrible example of evolution in action. Because that's all, the argument. Yeah, because all it's showing is natural selection. So you started off with moths that some are very light, some are medium colored, and some are very dark. Right. You, you had more, uh, you know, dark colored moss in, in one scenario, and then you end up with more light colored moss. Who cares? It's natural selection. <laughs> the, 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 there's no new information, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. And, and it's not just creationists that are saying this. Uh, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, um, L. Harrison Matthews, a biologist so distinguished that he was asked uh, to write the forward of the 1971 edition of Darwin's Origin of Species. Ooh, uh, yeah. So he's a very you know, prominent scientist. They want to get, get a, a, you know, he said this about the, the moths. The experiments beautifully demonstrate natural selection or survival of the fittest in action, but they do not show evolution in progress. For however the populations may alter in their content or light, intermediate or dark forms, all the moths remain from beginning to end, Biston betularia, the Latin name for peppered moths. Yes, and, and it turns out that the moths don't even rest on trees in, in the daytime anyways. Right. Uh, here, here's another admission by, uh, by another evolutionist here. Yep. In 25 years, we have found only two of these moths on the tree trunks or walls adjacent to our traps, one on an appropriate background and one not, and none elsewhere. So, <laughs> yeah, kind of interesting. Which is which is why the moths had to be glued to the trees to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> That's to get right. The photos of uh, uh, that, that appear in the textbooks. And Jerry Coyne, a very well-known evolutionist, anti-creationist, said dead moths were glued to the tree. And he, he admitted this, and then he said <laughs> that such a painful revelation that this is, this uh, the prize horse in our stable of evolution finding out that the moth story wasn't true. He said it was like finding out that Santa Claus wasn't real. <laughs> and the whole evolutionary scenario is like Santa Claus. So I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, the, the fact is, folks, you're going to see, see, the, the thing is, it's not that creationists aren't well liked because we have bad arguments. Creationists aren't liked because we have good arguments. And what one thing we're very good at is pointing out the flaws in the evolutionary stories because we sit there and we analyze them. We've got a team of scientists. We take looks at this. We, we produce things like this. And so more and more, the average layperson is going to school, being taught, in some cases, many fraudulent things, finding out they were fraud, and being offended and starting to ask some very specific questions. If your scenario is scientific, why are you teaching me lies? Yeah. And yeah. so that's why these uh, anti-attacks or, or rebuttals, or supposed rebuttals, are becoming popular.